All right, here we go. Ingram Smith, Bud Elliott back again for another episode of the Nolcast. I am uh, on vacation currently, so audio may not be great, but uh, great to connect. Busy day in the world of Florida State Athletics with uh, Clemson filing suit against uh, against the ACC. And honestly, we had gone ahead and planned on having a having a podcast anyways with a bunch of talk about uh, draft and pro day and look back at the combine and some other things. So good timing. Great to connect again, bud. And uh, we'll thank our friends at Tarpon Cellars and uh, Louisiana hot sauce as always. And we'll jump straight into a, uh, another episode of the Nolcast. Let's do this thing, man. So uh, the Clemson lawsuit is very similar to the FSU lawsuit. Um, an interesting wrinkle that I don't, I've not really thought to argue at this point, And they did throw in there, which I'm not really sure that, um, I think there's some reason why they argued this. I don't know if they're 100% serious about it. Uh, but they are basically saying that the grant of rights only uh, only extends to like a granting of rights while Clemson is in the ACC and not through 2036, which mm -hmm. uh, feels sort of doubtful to me. But I think they're interestingly pairing it with without including a lot of the actual GOR language in the lawsuit. And they're referencing uh, the fact that the ACC is currently suing Florida State, in part because Florida State actually put a lot of that language in its lawsuit, which the ACC claims is a violation of the contract, right? So Clemson's like, yeah, we're not going to include a lot of this language to which we reference because, you know, you guys are saying that's not allowed. Uh, however, we're going to argue this, right? <laughs> which is that the the granting of rights does not uh, does not apply. So uh, I did find that to be pretty, uh, pretty humorous. Um, what... Uh, I mean, this is, I guess, why now for Clemson is interesting. I've thought I got a couple yeah. of things, but I'm curious why you Yeah, I, I'd like to know your thoughts as well. I mean, Clemson is a, you know, there is a particular culture that surrounds that institution. Um, and um, I certainly think that you could read into it that they probably have a home somewhere. I don't think that's a ridiculous statement. I don't know that that's. I mean, look, we can talk about this. I don't know that I would. I would be a little bit hesitant to jump straight to the SEC. Uh, that you think that that's maybe where they're going, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I, I do think that you have to feel that Clemson's comfortable with doing something like this. Um, I also think that uh, you know one of the more interesting pieces of information I saw this morning as I was looking around um, before we did the show here, it's seven o'clock in the morning, my time where I am. Um, the list of schools that, that um, what approved suing Florida state is very interesting. Um, Virginia tech and Duke jump out at, at, to me at that Duke, There's, there's always been some kind of, I guess at this point, waning optimism from Duke that they might be involved in a, in a super conference, mainly because of basketball um, Virginia Tech, because it would be a new market for either of these conferences, and they have facilities and fan base, etc. But what is it? Duke, Wake, uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech, Syracuse, maybe Boston College, where those yeah. are the six. Um, so no surprise on the other. In Miami. Four. In Miami, I missed that. That okay. was yeah. Apparently, Miami approved the meeting to discuss suing FSU. Hmm. Okay. Well, that is interesting. Now, I, that does not imply that does not imply an approval of suing FSU. It it, mm -hmm. it implies an approval of meeting to discuss it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I want to say that Miami went all the way there. You know. Um. In fact, we don't know that a vote was ever actually held to approve, mm -hmm. as Clemson yeah. and Florida State yeah. both uh, both assert. Yeah, Clemson would tell you that it didn't, in fact, happen. Um. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would take from it from a Clemson perspective, that they they feel comfortable that there's a landing place for them. Um, I would also be on the lookout for maybe a third or fourth school uh, jumping into this at some point. Obviously, Carolina is the one that's made some uh, early rumblings to the extent. And, and look, you would think if Florida State and Clemson and Florida State has declared their more or less their intention to leave, Clemson is – suing the conference, although at the time stating that it remains a conference member. But if, if Carolina questions the metaphorical structural integrity of the conference, then 
you know, what are we really doing at this point and how close or how long will this process go on until um, some of these schools just realize, hey, look, you know, let's just get what money that we're guaranteed of and we'll throw it in the bank and, you know, build an athletic program that's reflective of, you know, the media partnerships and, and contracts that we have. So, um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Uh, you actually just said most of the thoughts I had. The only only other one I had is that they – maybe they don't feel good about the hearing coming up for the Knowles, and they wanted to get their iron in the fire before uh, – for the like, if FSU were to have a negative outcome at that hearing, uh, maybe they wanted to get ahead of that PR a little bit and just be like, hey, like this is not the only one uh, that you have to fight right now. So, you know, I, I agree with you. Carolina is uh, everybody that I read who I think does some modicum of research on this says that Carolina is like the most valuable property for both the Big Ten and the SEC. Now, it doesn't make them the most valuable at football. I don't know if I fully like. Let, let's say just arguendo that they're right. Is it by, mm-hmm. how, by how much, by a ton? I, I would certainly agree with the sec. I'm not sure about the big 10. In fact, I would probably disagree depending on how you look at this, but because of geography, uh, and geography and brand. And yeah, I mean, you tell the big 10 that they can go into a kid in Florida's house and use that recruiting level. I mean, that's a different, that's a, that's a game changer for them. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, exceptionally valuable property, exceptionally, you know, massive brand. Uh, there was a time where Carolina was one of the three or four largest brands in all college athletics. Uh, we're not there anymore, but uh, it's a big deal, certainly. Completely agree with you on that. Um, real quick, do you have a take on Trev Alberts leaving Nebraska for Texas A&M? Because that was interesting. I mean, he's a legend there. Um Yeah, um, I'm glad that that suit took the job. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, fair, <laughs> fair. <yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wasn't, I wasn't implying that, but yeah, now, now that I think about it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, it's, I don't know, man. Some of these moves work great for conferences when they change uh, and and land, and you know, big paychecks don't cure all ills. And I think it tells you that Nebraska's still got a lot of stuff internally that they're trying to work out. I think that's fair. Yeah, they. I was listening today to a Nebraska show, and they basically said that like the they still don't have a president or a chancellor or whatever it is uh, mm-hmm. because the, like the board is split on who they want it to be. And so, mm-hmm. uh, also, I heard Nebraska like got rid of like five of their seven recruiting people, um, and were on the hunt for new guys. So I don't know if Rule wasn't happy with that class or something, but uh, but that was interesting. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. So that uh, that being said, spring practice for the Knowles starts today, and I just kind of started to come up with a list of like things that I'll be curious to learn about after seeing spring practice this year. And man, this list is a lot bigger than last year's. Like last year's, I felt like we knew sort of exactly what this team was, and we were only wondering sort of what it could be. I think this year we both are wondering what it can be, but we're also sort of wondering like what is it? <laughs> you know, it, it's. Uh, so I guess let's just, I don't know if you, if you jotted down any, um, like, I, I think this would be interesting. Yeah, no, I woke up this morning to, to put together a sheet for the show and saw that you had more or less done it, bud. So, uh, yeah, no, this is a good comprehensive list. Um, similar to a list that you may want to make as you're going through the home buying process. And if oh. so, always want to partner with our friend, Chad, FSUHomeLoans.com is the website. Uh, Chad has helped more than 500 listeners at Nullcast, uh, including my co-host, uh, find their home or um, second home or investment property. Um, and there's nobody else to work with. So uh, nobody better to work with. FSUHomeLoans.com is the uh, website. And again, thank you to Chad for uh, making international null cast such as this one possible oh. nice um one thing when i was talking to chad the other day he pointed out was some of these online sites that you may play with show a great rate and not until the very end does it tell you that oh this this rate uh, includes buying two points so as long as you're mm. cool with you know extra five figures up front you may get an awesome rate elsewhere but uh <laughs> Chad, Chad tries to work with you like throughout the process with the rate you're actually going to get. And so it's not a waste of your time. Um, I, 
I don't think we've ever had any, anybody uh, call them and say, hey, that was that was not you know not worth my time. So 844 FSU loan is the number to call, just straightforward with the process. And that's why so many of our listeners have been happy with the legendary team. Uh, so I'm going to lead off here. Can DJU shut the door on the quarterback position being an actual competition? Now, that's kind of a multifaceted thing because it means – is, does he play super well? It also sort of speaks to, you know, guys like 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 Brock and Luke. How well do they play this spring? But I, I do think that like there is some chance he totally locks it down, and we enter summer saying, "Hey, like that's the guy, that's the dude leading." Brock and Luke are fighting for number two, and you know, hopefully it is it is close. But I, I think that's something I think we can learn coming out of spring. Like, is he definitively? You know, the guy, because this is his first year in this offense too. I mean, it's it, he's played a lot of college football, but it's he has just as much experience in this as as Luke does, and slightly mm-hmm. less than Brock does. Yeah, yeah, there are some you know commonality of concepts uh, between what they were doing at Oregon State and some of the traditional aspects of a Mike Norvell offense. But yeah, no, I mean, look, I, you, I, I believe you. have fully want the answer to this question to be yes. I mean, that, you went out and you got DJU and brought him in and uh, all the physical traits and, and skills that that kid has. That's <laughs> you want, you want it to be his position. You do. I mean, uh, they, the coaches think very highly of Brock uh, in my opinion and, and the immediate feedback on Luke was exceptionally positive, but you went out and you got DJU for a reason um, and you want him to be this very talented, very gifted bridge uh, to these two younger guys that you have in the in the system and are starting to develop. Completely. Um, all right, so what you got next? Okay, who are the leaders on this team? Bud? Yes. This reminds me of a message board conversation from the late 90s or something like that, but it does matter, and leadership's important, and um, – you know, he certainly had a lot of leaders uh, from the, you know, 2023 team go to Indianapolis and getting ready for a pro day that later this week that we can talk about in a second. But uh, leadership's a legitimate question. And who, in your opinion, are some of the names there? Well, Fuller was really happy uh, with Shaheen Brown and yeah. his oh. his emergence as, as a leader. Okay. So Shaheen Brown is number two on my list of okay. kids that I think are leaders and number one on that side of the ball. So, absolutely. And I think that side of the ball is probably the side of the ball where I'm more concerned about the leadership a little bit just because of, mm-hmm. of the amount of leaders that you lost, right? I mean, yeah. Deloach, Bethune, you know, Fisk, Verse in his own way, uh, you know, Jerry and, 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 and Renardo. Like, that's a lot of just old dudes that you lost who, who, who knew the right way to go about doing things. Um even though Fisk was only there for for a year, so who was uh, who was your number one? Mo Smith. Yeah, I think that's that's a good one there. Did you see his weight? I didn't. No, he up, put on some weight up to two ninety five allegedly. So oh, that's great. I shouldn't that's say great. allegedly, but you know, um, yeah. the yeah. Uh, most Mo Smith, Darius, and uh, to a, a little bit of a lesser extent, Jeremiah Byers are all guys that jump out on the offensive line, but Mo is uh, Mo number one significantly. Completely. Um, all right. Here's one for you I wanted to hit you with. Are we going to have somebody emerge who is a guy who's a go-to receiver? Like, as of now, I like some of the pieces that FSU has, but I, it last year it felt like you had multiple guys you could go to who could win one-on-ones, Right. I don't know. Like, I'm not saying they won't have one, but as of now, it's not clear to me who that guy is. And I'm hoping to learn that come spring. I'm hoping we get a positive answer to this question because otherwise it feels like Mike and Alex are going to have to coach their asses off in terms of finding different ways to use guys with uh, promising skills, but maybe not like the complete skill set. It's like, will they have a guy to step up? Because last year, I mean, let's face it, you're going to lose. Keon's probably more second round than first round now if, if you look at some of the latest mock drafts. Johnny is a very clear top 100 pick, according to everything I've read. And I definitely think there's still some chance Bell gets drafted, even though it's not a really good tight end year, and it's a great receiver year for the draft, which I think hurts some of the, the non-Brock Bowers uh, level tight ends 
especially because last year everybody took tight ends. I mean, like, like there were mm-hmm. a bunch of them. It was good. And I guess next year's tight end crop is pretty good. So there's a bit of like a sandwich thing where teams are like, do I really want to spend a draft pick on a non-premium position, which is what most of them kind of consider tight end to be. Um, but I still think like, so if you lose a guy, if you lose like a second and third rounder at receiver and a draft draft prospect at tight end, like that's, that's a boatload of, of pass catching production to lose. And I'm curious, like if anybody will emerge as a, like maybe like a nationally good number one, but like, are you going to have one of the better receivers in the ACC? On mm-hmm. this yeah. Um, the second way you phrase that, I'm, I'm fairly confident you can answer that with a yes. Uh, I said this from the, the day the guy got on campus, Benson. Benson is particularly with, with the skill set that your quarterback has. Uh, Benson can be very special in this offense. And we'll have to see what it looks like in spring. You lost a little bit of the development arc on this kid last year, but Hakeem Williams is the same thing. I mean, Hakeem is uh, – going to be a very special player. And I think the further you get into this year, the more evident that will be. Uh, so I actually think you're going to be okay at wide receiver. you got some some nice names. You're probably going to lose some kids in, in April. Um, you'll just have to see what the room looks like uh, post-portal because uh, you got a lot of you know, you got a lot of kids in there right now. Um, but it's a really talented group with a lot of uh, hardworking guys. And um, – Look, Keon Coleman was incredible, and it's a move that you make 100 times out of 100. Uh, but I do think you would have seen a hell of a lot more from Kentron uh, Portier last year and would have gotten a better idea as to what he is. So with those three guys, Williams, Benson, and, and Portier, all kind of complementary wide receivers and the fact that, you know, different skill sets, different body types, um, I, th- I think you're going to be pretty good at wide receiver. I do. I, th- I think they're going to need to be for sure. Uh, and there's some chance that Morlock takes a step up as well, which would be, uh, you know, much, much needed. Um, Kyle, uh, Kyle just got married last weekend. So congratulations to he and his family and his wife. And that's good stuff. Yeah. Still probably like the most uh, badass preseason like hype video I've ever seen. That was, uh, that was incredible uh, from last year. For, for those of y'all who saw that. I think part of your answer, though, is I, I definitely take heart in the idea that I'm very confident in, in the floor of this team because I think 1-85, to 85, the roster is starting to look uh, more like – like 185 is starting to look more like what you want it to look like in terms of there are not a lot of guys on this roster who would be wildly out of place at – like a Bam, Ohio State, Georgia type thing, right? I think the larger question for me is what is the ceiling of this team, right? Adam Fuller talks about the top of the triangle. Uh, you know, who are like we have our you know base level players we can trust, and then we have sort of our mid level players that are are guys that we do rely on, and then we have the top of the guys who are our game changers. That receivers kind of a position for me there. I, I don't think receiver will suck. We're, we're not backsliding to 2020, 2021, uh, where where this team was. Uh, but I definitely think there's a drop off from what you had last year. I just, you know, it will be figuring out how big that is. And like you said, hopefully it is Benson or, or Hakeem. Um, interestingly, if you go back to the last, uh, the last Memphis offense for Norvell receiver one was Demonte Coxie. Okay. Outside guy had some real juice. Do you know who receivers two and three were? Can't say that I do, sir. Two guys who now play running back in the NFL. Mm hmm. Antonio Gibson, who they used out at receiver, 735 uh, yards on 38 catches. Uh, and Kenneth Gainwell, who actually was a back for Memphis. Uh, Gibson was playing receiver at Memphis. Uh, but now both are in the NFL. Uh, and then they had a tight end, catch 335. And then Calvin Austin, the third, who uh, I believe also did some like return stuff in the NFL. My, my point here is I, I actually do have a ton of faith in Mike Norvell to – if, like, let's say no number one truly emerges, okay? Like a guy, it's like, all right, third down, we know who they're going to with the ball. Like sort of how it was with Keon when he was healthy last year. I've got quite a bit of confidence in Norvell of finding ways to use parts 
and craft offense using like minimize the the weaknesses and and really rely on the strengths for the most part. I th- thought he did a nice job of that at Memphis. I and mean, clearly he had some NFL talent. Like you got two guys catching balls there who are still in the league. Like that's not nothing. But uh, I I do have a lot of confidence in Norvell to put together an offense like that. Uh, next one for you. Well, I, your, your turn actually. What do you got next? Uh, let's see here. We've got um, can <laughs> uh, can Armella early or Simmons uh, enter the summer or exit spring with a chance to start? I think it'd be a great sign if one of these guys can take a jump. Now, Alex Atkins yesterday said that Armella would be working inside uh, a lot more at, at guard. Um, this is not a shot about his game, okay? Uh, we talked about this a lot when he was being recruited down the stretch. It's like, okay, like he has, in, in the camps against truly elite players, has struggled a good bit against the, those guys out in space. He may be a guy who, you know, he has some good power to his game, um, may just be better suited to play inside. Uh, you know, and and I mean, we dropped his ranking on 24-7 sports pretty hard over the last year. And he was a dude who grew a lot and was really impressive at age 15 relative to his peers at 15 years old. I liked him a lot in the freshman uh, All-American game down in Naples. Uh, but as other guys, you know, kind of passed him, like we dropped him all the way out of the top 247. So I see a lot of message board stuff like, hey, this guy was a five star. I'm like, not, not for us, you know, like I. I Guys, just because he was a five-star as a freshman doesn't mean he's going to finish as a five-star. Like Certain guys grow and develop and get caught and passed up. And I do think there's still something there to potentially like get value out of. It doesn't mean the guy's a bust just because he can't play or maybe won't be playing tackle you know, this year. Uh, with Jalen and Lucas Simmons, I mean, from what I hear, they still like Simmons a lot. I'm just curious. like That's a dude, could he make a big-time leap to where you could you could play a Washington inside? if you had to, or play a buyer. Now, that's not saying I don't have confidence in those guys because I actually have a good bit of confidence, if if healthy, in Washington, and, and I think buyers could take a step. Shit, I think you, I think you muted yourself. Uh, of course I did, bud. Of course I did. Um, oh, man. Even yeah. in New Zealand. Even in New Zealand, yeah. So, Lucas Simmons... Uh, it's kind of similar to Hakeem, except maybe even more so. Had his developmental arc interrupted last year um, due to you know medical concern. My understanding is all of that has since been cleared, and he's back to um, back at it. Lucas Simmons is um, one of the more physical, one of the more impressive pieces of clay that Florida State has on its roster. Like you look at that kid, and you're like, oh, that is a different looking specimen uh really long uh will continue to fill out great feet i I think anything's possible for lucas to be honest with you like if it clicks lucas simmons is probably a top 20 draft pick okay If, if it clicks if it if it all comes together uh lucas simmons is a very special football player um i will tell you that people think very highly of early as well. Uh, so I, I, and I don't think he's really in potential to start, but Andre Otto is a name that people need to have in the back of their mind as well. That That's going to be a, a player that I think is very influential in the years to come. Uh, so I like, you know, you got to like what you have, uh, what you've started to build along the offensive line. And um, all of these guys are, are part of it. But, yeah, we'll just have to see how, you know, where their opportunities come uh, as far as if it's a position change or whatever else. But, um, yeah, Lucas Simmons, it'd be interesting to see what he looks like throughout uh, spring, a full summer to lift and continue to, you know, grow his frame. Uh, But anything's possible for that kid. The other reason why I'm so interested in this is tackle depth, obviously, is really important if one of these guys actually competes for like comes out of spring with a chance to compete for a spot, if they have a good summer and a promising fall, that's a big deal because like, look, Darius has finally has a, a, a full off season of, of health, which is awesome. 
But his injury track record also scares the hell out of me, right? He has not been able to stay healthy as a football player. And I am I am worried, uh, as is I think almost every team in the country, uh, about tackle depth, right? Like there's not a lot of guys there who are proven. Additionally, the number one leader on the team doesn't exactly miss a lot of time, knock on wood, but he is constantly banged up and has a, a, a back issue, as we know it with Maurice, uh, that has plagued him for multiple years. Darius is probably your second best snapper. So if you told me that that they could, um, you know. Rich, Mark, uh, Richie Leonard may be your yeah. second best snapper. That could help a lot if he can actually, if he can do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like he did a little bit for UF. So, I mean, if you're able to get that done, that would help too quite a bit. You know, if you go in, you go in the season with like three tackles you can trust and like two centers you can kind of trust plus an emergency, that would be that would be huge. Um, do we think this O line could take like a, a substantial step? Yeah, I, I think you can. I think it may take a second for it all to come together. Okay, like Meach, pretty good football player. You know, probably not a guy that's going to play in the NFL for eight years or whatever, but uh, nice player. Uh, you're going to have to try to find a way to replace that. I think I think your other replacements may be easier to come about. Okay. Um, so I think uh, I think it's there. I think it may take a second to see what it looks like. Uh, but I would I would almost be surprised if you didn't end the year with better offensive line than you had last year. I think they almost need it. Like if if you if you roll back the same quality of offensive line play as last year, um, then I don't know if, if a playoff is in the cards. Um, I I was, I, was shooting I may be underselling him there, but it may be earlier. You know, Ferguson's a really good player. Leonard, that's impressive, true. good athlete. It may be instantaneous. It, you may see it from snap one against Georgia Tech. Um, you may be able but, to score enough against Georgia Tech anyway. Like mm -hmm. Georgia Tech's defense is Georgia Tech's defense is. I would be concerned about the Georgia Tech game if Georgia Tech's defense was not what it is. Not not that they're better, but just game one. Uh, Georgia Tech ended well. They've got a they've got a solid quarterback. Um, I just you know we'll we'll preview the Georgia Tech game in four months, but uh, their their defense is a is a mess, and I would expect Florida State to score an awful lot of points in Dublin. Completely agree there. All right, does this team have a like legitimate star pass rusher? This is kind of another spots where, like, I love the floor. Okay, I love the floor of that DN room. You, you, you get Tommy, right? You, you, you um, get L Lola Hale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you, you get Mar Mar Marvin Jones Jr., who I, I think has some upside. Pat Payton's obviously back. If it plays out as I have just described, but like Byron Turner is a fifth, is a, a fifth that I think every single ACC team would be like, hell yeah, that's a great mm -hmm. fifth. But I want to know, like, do they have a one? Do they have a guy that other teams? are scared about that they really are like damn it like we got a game plan around this guy big time now maybe that's pat payton like maybe he yep. takes a step as a pass rusher like he was disruptive last year getting the hand up a bunch but he didn't he wasn't getting to the qb a ton you know like does he have the ability to scare people because like as i look at this now like the payton of last year is like a really nice two and he would be a one on some acc teams he wouldn't be a one on like like a, a, a national championship type of team like a verse would be you know do they have like a two, two threes, a four, and a five? Or do they actually have a one? This is kind of a lot of these questions are centering around like, do they have like top of the pyramid type players? Mm -hmm. you know, DN's a spot where I'm really curious about. Yeah. Top of the pyramid type players and top of the pyramid type service is what you can get from congruity. Matt Lewis is a fantastic addition to the Nolcast and many other businesses that I've been fortunate to partner with over the years. Uh, Matt. Great dude, massive knoll, uh, congruityhr.com backslash knolls is the website there. Um, whether it be HR, payroll, or anything else that can uh, optimize the way that your business runs, would encourage you to keep them in the back of your mind. Okay, so I've said this for a couple, uh, I've said this for a while now, and absolutely believe it to be true. And I don't, 
you know, this is not a, a podcast that gets accused of being cheerleaders a whole lot, but Florida State legitimately has one of the better strength and conditioning programs in the country um, and coaches in the country. And you saw that in Indianapolis, and you'll continue to see that. Uh, Pat Payton's continued to – his body's continued to change. Uh, I, th- I think you'll get a lot from Pat. What I also think is that you'll just have – you just have numbers that – people in this conference can't really compete with, you know, I mean, if you're throwing a Jones jr. And, uh, Lola Lahela and, um, and Tommy, Tommy and, and like you said, Turner, and we'll have to see if anybody else comes online. What about Jaden Jones? Sir. Yep. Yeah. And there's a lot of optimism around him as well. Um, it just, I just don't think that a whole lot of teams can consistently block a rotation of four or five guys that you've got at defensive line throughout the course of a game. So uh, I think you're going to be really good there. Uh, you know, Peyton will be your your banner carrier, so to say. Uh, we'll have to see what he turns into. Uh, disruptive. Is it disruptive in, in getting to the passer? Um, we'll see. Quite possibly could be. I'm also not sure how many elite passing quarterbacks you face this year. Yeah, true. You know, true. like that, the depth uh, of which you just described, which I think you're completely accurate about, um, also speaks to, a, a, I think, a unit that should play the run pretty well overall and, and has, ha, like, they have some real size at linebacker, too. Uh, so a lot mm-hmm. of these teams you play are not necessarily elite passing teams, right? Florida certainly is not. Uh, Miami... I guess we'll see. I, I, there's certainly – there's a, a percentile outcome in which Cam Ward just kills it, right? And, like, they, maybe they're awesome, but maybe they're not. Um, I'm, I'm a little skeptical on that. Notre Dame, certainly probably more of a run team than a pass team. Um, I'm trying to think of – like, Georgia Tech will be one of the better offenses you face, uh, and they they run the quarterback a whole lot. It, it's, it's not an elite passing offense. So, uh, in terms of making it to the playoff – uh, you may not face a whole lot of teams that can really drop back and throw it super effectively. Uh, so maybe your schedule matches up with what you brought in uh, really effectively. Uh, all right, here's one for you. I think we can know this after spring. Is Earl Little just that guy at nickel? Like, does he just take the position and run with it? Three letters. Why, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I think uh, – I think you got a special player in Little. I do. Uh, I think of all the. I think you got a lot of great pieces in the portal this year. Um, in, from the interaction that I've had with him, really impressive kids too. Uh, Earl Little, I think, will be felt immediately. Uh, you know, and with the with the caveat that he's healthy and continues to you know rebound from some of the. I think he's had some shoulder issues that he's working on, but. Earl Little's absolute ball player, and uh, I think you'll I think the ACC will feel him from from snap one. I do. I think that's huge. Like like just because Jerrion played really well down the stretch last year. Uh, like the the game he had against Restrepo was extremely nice, and like that if if you get a guy you can really count on in Little, I think you got to be extremely excited about about your starting secondary. And honestly, that, that's a room where I mean they've not gone out and tried to do a ton in the portal. Uh, with because it, you you do like a lot of the existing players uh, that you have in house. You know, that that is a spot where they've recruited high school pretty damn well as well. So, you know, getting little to come in there and solidify that. Uh, Adam Fuller yesterday, you, you can watch it on YouTube. He said he's one of the best high school players he's ever scouted. So, and his high school coach obviously is a uh, is on the roster. So that, that's that's very high praise uh, from Fuller. So I'm curious about that, uh, and then. Here's another one for you. We could kind of figure this out in spring. What the heck does FSU actually have at linebacker? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, you you know what you got in Moody. Um, not Moody. Sorry. Murphy. Lundy. Uh, oh, Lundy. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my, my favorite player of the last 20 years, Nick Moody, just occasionally sneaks into the podcast every once in a while, but that's fine. Uh, yeah, no, you know what you got in Lundy. Uh, another guy that uh, I saw recently that just been been eating a lot of good lean protein, but looks uh, looks very impressive. Um, but uh, 
Now, Murphy, you'll have to feel, and, and you know, this is the, the position that I'm the most interested in in spring, and that I think that you can learn the most. Uh, a lot of optimism surrounding Cryer. Um, interesting to see what AJ uh, or what uh, Blake Nicholson looks like. Again, uh, name game in the last 25 years is getting me. Um, but uh, I think I think you can be good here. I don't I don't know exactly what the you know what the ceiling is at this position, but I, I do think that you can leave spring with an idea. Hey, look, you got one guy that you know exactly what he is. Uh, you've got this piece from Alabama that uh, is exceptionally physically talented. Uh, you know how he fits in in your scheme and takes to your coaching. You'll see, um, and then you've got a couple other pieces here in Cryer, Nicholson, um, Omar Graham that you know you just need to get a better feel for. Do you think that we will come out of spring knowing who the two starters are? No, I don't. Do you think we'll come out of spring knowing at least who one of the starters is? Yeah, I think, I mean, you, DJ Lundy is, is one of your starters, 100%. Yeah, I I think that's fair. Um, I mean, with, that, with Lundy, I think at least we know what you have, which is, you know, pretty important. I think we've hit, like, most of the, the relevant questions. I, do you have a pick for a guy who is not – I guess currently in your mind a starter who we're going to be talking about a lot coming out of spring. It's like, oh wow, like this guy is pushing. I mean, <clears throat> at linebacker or in general? I'll I'll say in in general, just kind of overarching that. And I know you had like thirty five minutes today. Do you consider Conrad Hussey to be a starter? Uh, I think he's in the mix, but I think if he locks up a locks up a starting spot coming out of spring, I think that would be a, a significant yeah. move. Look, there's been a lot of praise and high talk here, but Conrad Hussey moves in short distances, unlike maybe any other human I've ever seen before. But I mean, the, if, if it all comes together, Conrad Hussey has a physical skill set that you just don't see. Uh, that's a guy that that could be a exceptional player and one of the better players in the league by the time that he leaves. Uh, I don't know that it will necessarily be next year, uh, but that's someone that I would look at considerably. Um, I like that. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, it'd be really interesting to watch a running back uh, Roy Dale Williams. Uh, they think exceptionally highly of um, Toa Philly is Really, really good player who's continued to develop his body. Um, so a lot of fun, fun spots to look at. I mean, hey, you know what? This it's a pretty good roster, bud. Um, so it's uh, there's a lot to look at and a lot to take away from. But now, Conrad Hussey's one guy that I would watch and realize that sky's the limit for. I, I agree with that. I'm, I would say actually, Q Jones as well, as a guy mm -hmm. I mean, like with that kind of length and stuff. I, I Obviously, I don't think he's going to start because you have, you have AZ and Fentrell, but um, is a guy who could play a lot of rest for you? I, I think so. It could also allow you to do some interesting stuff, like with some of your dime packages. right? I mean, he does have a whole lot of length on him. I mean, AZ Thomas ain't small. Um, there there yeah. are some creative stuff you could do. You could play some dime stuff with more, like, if you wanted to, you know, more four-corner, five-corner type stuff, if you want. Uh, and, and a lot of teams when they go dime, they kind of go three three. But uh, I, I think it's it's certainly possible that you could do that. I'm I'm excited about this spring, man. Almost like last spring, there was I would say l like less teaching and more like, hey, we know what we have. We're going to try to fine tune this thing. They installed a whole bunch of stuff, like like really some advanced stuff. They're they're not going to do that this year compared to what they did last year. It's not to say they're going to dumb it down a ton, but I mean, you run spring differently when you got a guy that's played. You know, thirty college games at quarterback in like in your system, entering and you know, re re receiver was returning. Most of the offensive line was returning. You know, like your your backs were were returners. Uh, you know, Keon uh, came later, but you know, Johnny was was a returner. Um, so it's gonna be a different spring, but it's it's a very interesting spring to see again. Like like Fuller says, like who who are these top of the pyramid guys? Because to me, like that's gonna 
that's going to mostly determine where this team goes. I'm really confident in this team's floor. I just don't really have a feel for what the ceiling on this team is yet. And that's going to be the, like you need you need studs. Yep. Like a lot of guys, body wise, it look like they'll make NFL rosters. You know? Big thanks to our friend at Charlie Park. Uh, literally, we get about an email a week uh, or a direct message on uh, on Twitter about somebody that decided to go and try it after listening to the podcast and uh, have nothing but great things to say. And so whether it's Charlie Park, Matso, Township, um, or the awesome new spot that uh, that we've talked about that blanks me as far as all the great beats and everything. It's a quality ad read, Matt Thompson. You're welcome. Uh, but, uh, no, there's awesome spots. Anywhere you go within the For the Table uh, restaurant group, uh, family of properties, and uh, Charlie Park is uh, its just a little oasis over there in Cascade Parks, and or Cascade Park, lovely area, lovely time. But I'm going to have to let you close out the podcast here, uh, and I've got to go. I apologize. Nice, dude. Enjoy New Zealand, man. All right, bud. Talk to you soon. All right, man. I'll see you all. All right. So, um, uh, some closing thoughts here. We'll probably do a little, like a short or two on the YouTube channel coming up. Pretty excited about doing that. Uh, I will say I went out and I saw, uh, I was in Arizona for some business stuff and I stopped over to Arizona State's practice and got to see uh, Kenny Dillingham. And I, man, I got to tell you, like, Dillingham, much better coach than I, as, as far as doing head coach stuff in year one than I anticipated him doing. Uh, the, the roster that he had, there's usually like one team a year in, in college football that is so bad that they're having to, because of injuries typically, having to pull like defensive linemen over to play offensive line. In 2021, or was it? Yeah, tw sorry, 2022, that was Boston College. In 2023, that was unfortunately Arizona State. They played like a million different combinations. They never had guys healthy. It was, it was pretty brutal. Uh, and this year just looks like so much more of a competent roster. Now, the schedule is crazy. The, the Big 12, because they're moving over from Pac-12, they kind of screwed Arizona State. So they're, they're only four home games. they got to play five conference road games. You, you get that every other year. Uh, but they really play, I think, all of the top teams in that league. Like They get Utah. They get Kansas State. They get Kansas. They get uh, Oklahoma State. They get Texas Tech. They get TCU. So, uh, man, if Arizona State can make a bowl game this year, that would be, a, in my mind, kind of a minor miracle. Uh, but... I do kind of like what they're building there. And I, I could see them taking a big step forward uh, in terms of the win column in 2025, because what you know, goes around comes back around and the schedule will be, will be far easier in 25. So it was good checking up uh, with a former Noel uh, coaching staff member who got out there. And uh, I, I'm, I think they're a little ahead of schedule based on, on the absolute disaster that, uh, that Herm Edwards uh, left there after that, that big scandal. That they had, and I'm really excited about this Knowles team, and I'm curious to see, like, can they, can they win the league again? If you do, go into the playoff. So, awesome, y'all, and we'll check back soon.